light out everybody what's up everybody welcome back to another episode of the lights out podcast i'm your host josh and joined in the studio is my co-host austin what's up man hey, how's it going and then today i'd like to introduce the man behind the scenes so you guys haven't met him yet but this is daniel daniel is our editor producer he runs all of our cameras and all of our multimedia for the episodes so what's up daniel what's up everybody so daniel is going to be starting to chime in here every once in a while probably at the end of episodes especially when we're, we're talking theories or you know we're kind of debating on some different things because i think what's cool about this group uh, at lights out is we all have you know similar opinions but we also have some differing views on things and you know the more voices that you can get into these conversations i think the better um, cause yeah, many of you out there have a lot of differing opinions as well. Um, as you like to, to let us know via the comments on YouTube yeah. and all that kind of stuff. And, and also I just want to thank people for showing up for the YouTube premieres. Austin's been doing that. And yeah. Those are a lot been of really fun. enjoying that. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. I love seeing everyone chatting and, and there's some fun conversations in there for every Friday. So yeah. We, when... we shoot for Fridays at like 1230 mountain time. Yeah. Um, it's generally when we try to go live with our, our episodes and I think it's great cause it just kind of gets the you know, community feel going, right? Yeah. And just I, kind of bounce things it. off live. Yeah, because sometimes we're we're just in the trapped in the studio. So it's it's fun to get to see the who we're giving our content to and like exactly from them. So come yeah. hang out. Yeah, it's over at YouTube. So if you, you know, watch the show or listen to the show on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, feel free to check us out on YouTube as well. But today we're gonna be diving into probably one of the most heinous and brutal crimes uh, that we've covered here on Lights Out to date. We're going to be covering the absolutely horrific murders of the Pettit family that took place in Cheshire, Connecticut. And this one hits really close to home, especially now that I'm a parent, um, because what happens in, in this case is literally anyone's worst nightmare. But as a parent, it's it's like takes it to a whole nother level. Where I'm just like, I don't even know how you'd be able to go on with life after something devastating happened to your family yeah this was easily one of the worst ones i've had to research just uh, emotionally tragic across the board and unlike a lot of our episodes where we, we don't really use a lot of like clips and things like that this one's going to be pretty clip heavy because there actually was a documentary done um years back on hbo i believe on this particular case and there's just so many clips that i felt like we had to include to really capture the emotion and just the the tragedy that occurred and honestly you, you probably be leaving this one feeling angry i know i did i feel pretty angry about what happened to the suspects this is the cheshire murders we have a lady who is in our bank right now who says that her husband and children are being held at their house that if the police are told they will kill the children and the husband. Those animals, what they did to those poor people uh, in Cheshire. People are asking about a timeline, you know, when did this occur, when did that occur? That's not something that, that really the public really needs to be concerned about at this point in time. The first Cheshire police officer to arrive at the scene heard at least one of the girls screaming from inside the house. Upon arrival at the victim's residence, the first officer observed the private residence fully engulfed in flame. If you're for the death penalty, this is the poster child. No question about it. It just shows the level of depravity of Joshua Kobazajewski. That I am fundamentally evil. I have engaged in that kind of activity. You destroy a family the way those two did. Do whatever you gotta do. Make sure that you're gonna walk this earth again. So Cheshire, Connecticut was once a small farming community. But now it's known for its old, beautiful homes, well-kept gardens, and colorful trees in the fall. Not only that, they have plenty of well-maintained parks and tennis courts that fill the quiet neighborhoods. And its great schools nearby make it a perfect place to raise a family. That was the Pettit family's goal when they first moved there in the early 1990s. But it would later become known as a town where one of the most absolutely disturbing crimes in the history of Connecticut ever took place. William Pettit Jr., or Bill as his friends and family called him, was born on September 24, 1956. He grew up near Plainville, Connecticut, where his father ran a local store. From a young age, Bill helped his dad manage the store, 
and by high school he had a career goal of his own to become a doctor. When he graduated high school in 1974, he attended classes at Dartmouth College, where he got his bachelor's degree. After that, he enrolled in the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine, and then later on he went to the University of Rochester School of Medicine, and he ended up finishing his education at Yale University School of Medicine. While doing his rotations at a children's hospital, he met a woman named Jennifer Hawk, a pediatric oncology nurse. And for Bill, it was love at first sight. Whenever he was around her, he tried to act confident and smart to get her attention. Eventually, though, he got the courage to ask her out. And on the evening of their first date, Bill's parents were so excited for Bill that they crashed the date and showed up at the same restaurant. I'm sure that was a fun surprise for Bill. <laughs> Confused, Jennifer didn't expect to meet Bill's parents on the first date, but she went along with it. They ended up having a good time, eating dinner and then going out for drinks afterwards. Even though his parents rolling up to a first date is a red flag for some, she wasn't intimidated or concerned by it. And Bill and Jennifer ended up forming a long-term relationship together. Back at work, Bill later specialized in endocrinology and opened up his private practice just down the street from his dad's old general store. He lined the walls of his office with pictures of his family, and he soon made a name for himself in the local community. After a while, Bill proposed to Jennifer and they got married. And on October 15, 1989, they had their first daughter that they named Haley. Six years later, Jennifer gave birth to their second daughter, Michaela, on November 17, 1995. They raised their two children in their large home on Sorghum Mill Drive in Cheshire, Connecticut. The neighborhood was quiet and peaceful. The house was a stone's throw away from a local reservoir and a hiking trail through Roaring Brook Park. They thought it was the perfect place and perfect home to raise their kids with a basketball hoop and a trampoline in the backyard. They mostly lived an uneventful life until 1998, when Jennifer was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. So for those who don't know, it's also called MS. Um, it's a pretty brutal disease. It's unpredictable and uh, it attacks the body's nervous system over time. Mostly impacts the brain, spinal cord, optic nerves, disrupts the flow of information between the brain and body. Symptoms are fatigue, memory problems, mood swings, um, sometimes even blindness or paralysis. What's frustrating about a lot of people who suffer um, from MS is that they we don't really know what cause. causes it. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of a mystery, and it's a brutal. And uh, I believe it ends up killing you eventually. Yeah, yes, it's it's pretty much a terminal disease. Yeah. That's horrible. I mean, that's a lot to deal with for this family. So after her diagnosis, Jennifer and the Pettit family reached out to friends and family to support the annual MS walk in Connecticut. Her daughter Haley also became involved. In over seven years, from when she was 10 years old to 17, she raised $55,000 during these annual walks. That's really impressive. Growing up, Haley was known as a quiet and modest girl. She was also driven and intelligent. She went to an all-girls school, Miss Porter School actually, in Farmington. She ran cross country and played on the basketball team. She was also elected to the school senior leadership position of the athletic association head. She became an honor roll student and also won prizes for their work in the school paper. She even won an award for exceptional community service. It also goes without saying that she was respected by her classmates and the school faculty. From a young age, she tagged along with her dad when he went into the doctor's office. And even though they both had busy schedules, they still found time to spend with each other. Soon, Haley wanted to be like her dad, and she planned on going to medical school after high school graduation. Her plan was to attend Dartmouth College in 2007. As for her younger sister, Michaela, she was in elementary school at the time. She was involved in athletics where she played soccer, basketball, and lacrosse. She also played the flute in the school orchestra. At home, she had developed a love of cooking from an early age. When her father would come home from work, he would catch Michaela on the couch watching the Food Network or in the kitchen practicing her cooking. She was also known for her love of books. At age 11, she was looking forward to starting the Harry Potter series. As her sister planned on going to college in the fall of 2007, Michaela planned to take over her sister's walk for MS organization called Haley's Hope. Once Michaela took it over, she was going to rename it Michaela's Miracle. Much like her sister, Michaela also had a strong bond with her father. Bill had season tickets to the men's and women's basketball at the University of Connecticut, and he made it a tradition to take his daughters to every game. The tight-knit Pettit family also ate dinner together almost every night, and even the neighbors could see how close and loving they all were. Unfortunately, in 2007, Michaela would never get a chance to read those Harry Potter books that she looked forward to, 
and Haley would never attend Dartmouth to go to medical school like her dad. Tragically, their lives were cut short. July 22, 2007 was a typical Sunday for the Pettit family. Bill, Jennifer, and Michaela all went to morning mass. Meanwhile, Haley had been spending the weekend at a friend's house celebrating their recent high school graduation. She returned home later that afternoon. Bill and his father, Bill Sr., went and played a round of golf at the local country club, and the rest of the Pettit family spent the beautiful summer Sunday together on a beach. In the evening, Michaela wanted to cook dinner for the whole family, so she and her mom went to a local grocery store in Cheshire to pick up some ingredients for a pasta dish. What they didn't realize when they went into the grocery store was that there was a man that had been following them, 26-year-old Joshua Komasarjewski, and he planned on stalking them all the way back to their home. So Joshua was born August 10, 1980, to a mother who was only 16 and a mechanic who was 20. He was then adopted by a fundamentalist Christian couple when he was only two weeks old. His father, Benedict, was described as critical, cold, and controlling, and his mother, Jude, was known to be quite submissive and really didn't do too much to intervene when things got heated in the household. Friends and family described Joshua as brilliant but a troubled young man. He was actually homeschooled by his father from an early age. And during his schooling, his parents claimed they wanted to instill Christian values in the boy by pulling him out of public school. But these Christian values taught Joshua from an early age to reject the world. As he grew up, he lost his grandfather, who he was close to, and he fell into a deep depression. Some say he also began participating in occult ceremonies in his teenage years, along with a few friends in his hometown of Cheshire, Connecticut. His mother once said that Joshua was easily influenced and controlled by others as he grew up. One day she went into his bedroom and noticed that he had written all over the walls. With black and red ink, he wrote, death, die, and suicide across his bedroom. It was later found out that during his childhood, Joshua had been raped by someone he trusted. His parents had fostered a 15-year-old boy named Scott, and Joshua claimed that his foster brother sexually assaulted him multiple times, starting when he was only three years old. Years later, Joshua's foster brother, Scott, later admitted to raping Joshua, and he has since registered as a sex offender. So I actually want to play you a quick clip here from the documentary that is actually Joshua's defense attorney talking about some of the abuse he suffered as a child. Josh was born into a family with a history of mental problems. Then he was adopted by a family that had no ability to cope with mental problems. And so he was doomed by biology, and then he was doomed by fate. When Josh was three years old, uh, the family took into the home uh, two foster children, a girl and a boy. And Josh underwent really horrible and extensive sexual abuse at the hand of Scott. I think it started off playing little sex games, um, having him pose naked, and then it proceeded to full-scale anal intercourse and to, and to Josh's being burned with cigarettes. Based on everything the attorney just said, uh, that is absolutely horrific yeah. uh, child abuse. And I think what you find in a lot of criminals, especially killers, is that oftentimes in their childhood there is sexual abuse that occurs. And... It's just, I mean, it makes sense. It, it definitely shapes them in a certain type of way. And for Joshua, I mean, he's growing up in this extremely religious Christian setting. And these things that are happening to him are, you know, according to them, an abomination. Yeah. And so it's a, to live with that. Yeah. And it's important to note that, you know, obviously not everyone who is sexually abused from a young age goes on to become something yeah, evil right right um but i think in joshua's case which we'll see in a little bit is that his upbringing his parents did not help whatsoever in in his trauma so he had to deal with it in a very strange way that that didn't help him in the end right and oftentimes you know religion is used in replacement of actual therapy and psychological help right. where when you go through something so traumatic like this, you really need to deal with that. And, you know, just, you know, keeping him in the current setting that he's in is only making it worse as time goes on and, and things like that happen to you. And this is evil that's happened to you. So it starts making you feel like you're evil. And I think this is something Joshua really wrestles with 
throughout most of his life is is he a good person or is he an evil person and yeah as as we'll see later on yeah, um it the, seems that the evil the big overtones over. too which goes with a lot of evangelical churches i know is uh homosexuality right um so just interacting with something like that and they're so homophobic about it that it makes it made him believe that he had done something so terrible that like even in the eyes of god it was could never be forgiven or something yeah yeah, yeah it's 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 really horrible yeah the fundamentalist church that they were a part of which i think i believe was called evangelical bible church basically they rejected any form of psychology or psychiatry any kind of mental health treatment whatsoever so uh joshua's parents were very gung-ho about this um and they also studied the teachings of a guy called bill gothard um, oh uh, who's, yeah i've heard of him yeah and yeah. he's known through the institute in basic life principles he essentially believed that mental illness was caused by a slew of things guilt irresponsibility believing lies fear inanimate objects and psychiatric fallacy i'm not sure what psychiatric fallacy is so this is really interesting to me because the church that i went to for many years shared similar feelings of this and oh, actually really? my parents for a long time were against therapy and against therapists and against any sort of mental help in that capacity because they believe that it's like you're being in hypnotism too that was like another thing oh, going wow. to see like a hypnotist therapist they're like they're manipulating your mind and allowing basically the, the i think the idea is that by seeing a mental health professional they have the capability of opening your mind up to evil and to demons and to things like that and so wow. um, which is just insane to think about it. and yeah. like my parents have always been resistant to therapy even to this day and they're not as like deep in in the religion as they used to be but even to this day i mean i've tried so many times over the years to be like let's go to therapy and like discuss these issues and they just like refuse wow. and i don't know if that's because they think it's you know spiritually it's going to open them up to stuff but i think it's more so they don't want to unpack uh you know things from the past and so I, I think that's kind of a part of it too is like they know that if you go see any sort of mental health professional they're not going to go along with your philosophy right in the way right. that you're going to deal with problems they're not going to be like oh yeah just pray more and this is going to go away they're going to be like no you have this disorder you have some sort of mental health issue that needs to be addressed and so they don't want to hear that yeah and i think when you get deep enough into to religion and you start blocking out science and things like and neuroscience things like that that are facts you know these are this is how your brain works we've studied the brain that um you're really you're really on a dangerous path because it, you know it's very easy to slip into uh delusion and you know this idea that demons are all around you and, and attacking you and there's a spiritual war and you can't let anybody open your mind because you're going to be attacked by demons and they're going to basically take hold of you and so that was like drilled into me at a young age and i went to similar churches like this um growing up and i just this is all it's kind of weird this all bringing back like memories right now as, yeah. as i'm talking about this and it's just it's i think for people who don't you know maybe didn't grow up religious or maybe a, a part of a different religion or dom denomination it's hard to imagine growing up in this sort of mind state but it's very real and it took a long time for me to remove myself from that mind state i mean it took me years to fully kind of detox myself from this way of thinking because i mean it's all rooted in fear ultimately right it's right. all rooted in well you're going to go to hell if you don't do these things and you don't follow the bible to a t you know you're opening yourself up to the devil yeah. uh, taking you over so and like what you were saying yeah that was that's what this guy said um bill gothard he was saying that the cure for mental illness is like you were saying prayer self-examination taking back strongholds which i'm not sure exactly what that means yeah over the years all these teachings obviously have failed to help anyone suffering from depression anxiety ptsd right. there's never been one case where people have figured out yeah this is this actually worked it's always failed um but unfortunately these people get wrapped up in in religion so for joshua's family they were very strict about these teachings but in the end they didn't really help him yeah it's interesting too because there's just 
made me think of of one of my one of my old friends. His parents were like uh, foster parents for a lot of kids. Like I would go over to their house, they'd have like ten kids running around. They're all foster kids, but they were all kind of forced to subscribe to this way of thinking and attend the church and like sort of be brainwashed by this way of thinking. And I'm just thinking back, I'm like, God, it's so dangerous. Like, and luckily they were good people and like they weren't, there was no abuse as far as I know or anything like that. But it's just like, it's interesting how people who are in, in these more radical denominations of Christianity, I've, I've found you find a lot of foster parents in there. And so a lot of these kids are getting subjected to this way of thinking and ideology that elsewhere they would never be subjected to and you know and the foster parents minds are doing them a service like oh we're bringing you to god and you know putting you on the right path but in reality it's it's doing quite the opposite yeah and doing them a major disservice by sheltering them from the world i mean that's really what it is it's like sh- you know you have no exposure to the world homeschooled too yeah my friend was homeschooled and it was a major like difference between his way of thinking and mine and luckily i my parents tried to actually homeschool me several times and I was, I was always like, you homeschool me, I'm, I'm literally leaving the house and yeah, you won't see me you. again. Yeah. I put my foot down with that and luckily they never uh, succeeded with that because it's isolation. It's yeah. a way to isolate you, get you away from the people of the world, as they would say, and who will influence you because ultimately they know you're going to go to a public school and you're going to get all these new ideas and things like that, music, things like that. And, and it's going to influence you and probably pull you. They know it's going to pull you out of what they want you to do. Yeah. Funny and, enough. Yeah. Like that was the, one of their, they were very open. This church was about like one of their fundamentals was rejecting the world. Like right. you were saying, yeah, th- like, this is real terms that are used. And, and like, I mean, I, that was growing up. It was like, you are, you become a soldier for Jesus, a Jesus freak, whatever you want to call it. And you are not like, there'd be sermons literally like, you are not a part of this world. I'm like, what? Damn. Like literally, they'd be like pounding into your head. You are not a part of this world. You are a part of the kingdom of God. And, da, da, da. and it'd just be like, and after a while of sitting there, you're like, you're, you start believing and you're like, oh, me and the rest of these people are not a part of this world. And then you start and you wonder why there's a lot of judgmental Christians out there. Well, it's because of churches like this where they're pounding that into your head, which is so funny to me because Jesus if you look at the biblical teachings of Jesus, Jesus was quite the opposite. Jesus was like oh, cool with really? everybody. He was out there, you know, just trying to help the world. And he didn't care if you were, you know, a believer or not or whatever. It was like, you know, I'm just here to be a good person, really. Yeah. And that's the biggest irony, right? Is yeah. that like the biggest Jesus freaks are doing exactly the opposite, opposite of what, of what Jesus said. would actually yeah. do. Jesus would be like, gather everybody here. Let's all talk. Let's all chat. Let's all break bread together and you know, these people are like, we got to convert these people. They're all, you know, agents of the devil. And right. anyways, I'm getting off track here. I go on and on about this, but I just want to provide a little bit more context and some personal infusions from my own experience. Because I, I really do understand, besides the the abuse, I've, I've never been abused or anything like that. So I can't speak on that. But as far as the religious aspect of it, I definitely can relate with Joshua there. But again, it's no excuse for what he ends up doing later on. One New Year's resolution I had for this year was to try and not order takeout so much. Takeout costs a ton of money and it's really not that good for you most of the time. So that's when I turn to every plate. What's great about every plate is that their meals are 58% cheaper than your average fast casual meal. You get more bang for your bite with America's best value meal kit. HelloFresh actually owns every plate and every plate is their most budget conscious meal kit, which I absolutely love. And honestly, the recipes that every plate offers are all absolutely delicious. And what I like about them is they're just super simple to make. It's not nothing fancy, but it's hearty, delicious, and you can get them made in 30 minutes or less. Every plate provides plenty of delicious variety, so your taste buds never get bored with 25 tasty and affordable recipes to choose from each week. It's easy to find something for everyone, plus find delicious options all day long with up to 22 sides, snacks, desserts, and more. What's great is that you just go on the app or online and you set up your meals for the week and you just forget about it. And an every plate box shows up every single week with everything that you ordered. I've never had any issues with produce or anything going bad. And if you do ever run into that issue, every plate takes care of it and sends you replacements right away. So if you haven't tried every plate, check them out. It is extremely affordable and the recipes are top notch. 
get $1.49 per meal by going to everyplate.com slash podcast and entering code lightsout149. Again, get started with EveryPlate for just $1.49 per meal by going to everyplate.com slash podcast and entering code lightsout149. So the older that Joshua got, the more time he spent out of the house. According to an ex-girlfriend, he hated being at home. So he'd go out at night and watch people through windows and then fantasize about living their lives. He soon began robbing local stores. And when he was 14, he set fire to an abandoned gas station. After being caught by police, he was hospitalized for two weeks in a mental health institution, the Elmcrest Hospital in Portland, Connecticut. At first, Joshua was open to receiving treatment and medication, but of course his father didn't want him there. He refused to give his son any medication or professional treatment, and instead he sent Joshua to a faith-based treatment program. According to his ex-girlfriend, the church would perform small-scale exorcisms. Church members would pray and lay their hands on Joshua, hoping that the devil would leave his body. This was basically how Joshua's family addressed his problems for years. And for a short, pretty brief period of his life, he actually joined the army reserves. By the time he was 21, his problems had time to fester, but he did his best to avoid them. Instead, he dreamed of being an architect, and he talked about his dreams with the last counselor he talked to. Here's a clip of the counselor talking about Joshua. It was so disappointing because I knew I was the last person therapeutically that met with Josh and could really paint a picture of him in a different light. And I knew that the media and most people's opinion of him would go against what I saw and what I knew. Josh just wanted to do better things with his life, staying clean, reconnecting with his family, and possibly going forward with an education to become an architect. I saw someone who created some beautiful designs, these sketches. I mean, this kid was amazing. This is something that's unnatural. This is a pure talent. He had to have practiced this and worked on this for years. Pretty incredible drawings, honestly, despite yeah. this guy being a piece of shit. Uh, clearly he did have talent. And that's the thing is, it's just like, if he had gotten on the right path earlier on and, you know, not subjected to the abuse he, he experienced, I mean, it's just like crazy to me how important those early years of your life are. And just as a parent, you play such a role in shaping your kid. And I've just found that across the board with, with tons of, of crimes and cases is just like being a parent is like the most important job. And when parents don't take that seriously or they don't, you know, they subject their kids to, you know, certain styles and ideologies. I'm just like, ah, oh, you're, you're setting your kid up for a much tougher path. Not to say that kids can't, you know, break out of these things. I mean, and, and go on and, and do great things because people do that all the time. But in, in some cases, especially when you're not getting that mental help, I mean, he was counseling and he seemed to really enjoy that and get and get something out of it and clearly the counselor was able to analyze him to the point where he was like man if i had just gotten to work with him a little bit longer and he had been able to kind of stay on this path who knows what he would have ended up doing yeah and he would have been able to get out of sort of this this early life of crime and, and getting in trouble and, and things like that and we know his dad definitely would not have allowed him no, to absolutely yeah. not so Joshua ended up having a daughter with his then girlfriend, but his girlfriend struggled with drug addiction and was in and out of rehab centers. And since Joshua was in and out of prison so often, his daughter was sent to live with his parents. Meanwhile, his life of crime and violence continued and he became a professional at home invasions. We've got a clip of his defense attorney talking about Joshua and some of his crimes. Burglary, 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 and burglary genius that he is, and he is a genius in, in some respects, with a photographic memory and uh, uh, attention to detail that uh, no normal mind could possibly uh, retain. He told him every burglary he did. He knew every item he took, passports, what dumpsters he threw it in. Joshua could get into the third floor, steal things, know which denominations of bills he took a, a year later, two years later tell you where each wallet was, what kind of pants they were taken from, where the pants were on the floor, on the bedpost, in the closet. 
stay there for hours, not get caught. Joshua used relatively sophisticated equipment for a burglar, night vision goggles, latex gloves. After he'd robbed the house, he would stay there on occasion and listen to the people breathing. And go from room to room listening to the occupants breathing for no apparent purpose. Um, that was the frightening part of it. He robbed state troopers' houses, which takes some guts. And I said, Judge, he needs to be watched. This, this kid is sick. You're never going to see him again, or he's going to be the worst criminal that passed through these doors, because that's the kind of a mind he's got. When you hear just how intelligent he is and his photographic mind and his capabilities as a criminal is just, it, it is terrifying. Yeah. I mean, his rap sheet, the amount of burglaries that this guy did is absolutely insane. And when you add it all up, Joshua should have been in prison for life, honestly, for the amount of burglaries that he did. And this dude's in the house with the occupants there sneaking around. I mean, it's just, it's just terrifying. I mean, I think it's all of our like worst nightmare when we go to bed at night is like, there's somebody in the house that's just waiting for us to go to sleep to do whatever. And the fact that this guy was actually doing it just blows my mind. Yeah. I mean, it was kind of just a matter of time because I think that is the creepiest part about it is that he would stay in the house for no reason just to listen to people sleeping. Home invasion is one thing. Robbery is one thing, but clearly there's something else going on with this guy. He's like a stalker too. He's, he's got this whole other element to him. I mean, he was in the army too. Yep. So obviously he picked up some skills there. He knows how to use night vision goggles, things like that. Yep. And so he's like, you know, you look at most burglaries and they're in and out, you know, they're trying to get in and get what they want and get out as quickly as possible. I rarely hear of burglars who are hanging out in the house for hours at a time, just listening to people breathing. And I mean, that's just, that's just scary. And I think the loophole was that technically he hadn't committed a violent offense he was simply like on paper it was only robbery so i think when, home invasion is a violent offense like that's aggressive behavior if you're breaking into a home that is a violent offense and obviously robbery is a violent offense versus like theft is not a violent offense you're just stealing an object or something but it's it's absolutely insane that he, he ends up going to prison for nine years for possession because he struggled with methamphetamine, but then he only served five years before being paroled. Meanwhile, he had been involved with 20 home invasions before 2002. And by 2007, when he was just 26 years old, he had found his next target, the Pettit family. And he couldn't wait to tell his accomplice, Stephen Hayes, about his plan. So remember, Joshua finds his victims, the Pettit family, at the grocery store. And the guy that he ends up going after the Pettit family with is Stephen Hayes. So before we get into the whole crime that unfolds, here is a little bit of background on Stephen Hayes. Stephen Hayes was born May 30th, 1963 in Homestead, Florida. He lived with his mother and two brothers. And according to his brother Matthew, Stephen was always controlling, violent, and manipulative even from a young age. And I think his brother's testimony is super important here to really get an accurate understanding of Steven. So let's hear a little bit from his brother. Attention, Detective Fran Budwitz of the Connecticut State Police. I give this statement to aid and assist those who now have the burden and huge responsibility of seeking justice. My earliest memories of Steve go back to age four or five. Steve presented himself as the apple of everyone's eye. What many people did not see was the brother I knew. Being young and naive, I arrived home from school in seventh grade. Stephen and his friends were using the oven to try out some marijuana. He turned on the burner on the stove. He told me it was really cool and put my hand over it. It's cool, you won't get hurt. As soon as I put my hand over the burner, he pushed my hand onto the hot burner, and I had ring scars that lasted for months. To say there hasn't been a history of violence, well, this should, this should serve to say the predisposition was there. It was always there. 
I think all of us, to some degree, you know, you grew up with a brother. I grew up with a brother. There is a little bit of, you know, here and there, punch him yeah, in you the get shoulder. Into it sometimes. And, yeah, you get into fights and stuff. But personally, I've never been scarred by my brother, though. No, and I, and I would never trick my brother into doing something that I knew would harm him severely. Like, yeah. like, it's one thing to play a prank on your brother or something like that, like fart spray or something, you know, right. like something like that. But to tell your brother that the stove isn't hot and then have him put his hand over there and smash his hand on there where you're going to get burned. Uh, that's just evil to me. Yeah. I mean, that's just like, that says a lot about him. It's violent and it's deceiving. It is. Me, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, he's, and I think that describes it perfectly. And you can just see in that clip, like his brother's almost just like fuming, even like recalling this memory. It's just like, I very much appreciate that he, he wrote this letter. It does play into how, you know, what kind of person Steven is. So, so there's actually one incident where Stephen put the barrel of a revolver to his brother's head, but he claimed he was just messing around. According to his attorney, Stephen had been sexually abused as a child. By the time he was 16, he had been convicted of an unknown crime and sentenced as an adult. He was paroled two years later in 1982, but violated the conditions of the parole seven weeks later. And over the next several decades, he was arrested somewhere around 30 more times, and he spent most of his adult life behind bars. In 1992, he had a daughter named Alicia with his then girlfriend, but they split up soon after and Alicia went to live with his ex. After this, Stephen was only allowed to visit his daughter once a week. During this time, Stephen made a living by breaking into cars and stealing whatever he could find. Eventually, his life of theft introduced him to Joshua, when they were both rooming together at a halfway house between prison sentences. Stephen would stay at his mother's house for a while, but neither of his brothers could stand him. Once they were out, it wasn't long until the two of them planned on invading the Pettit family home. Neither of them could hold down a job for long. After Stephen locked himself in a hotel room for a day while doing crack cocaine and heroin, he went to a local AA meeting. There, he met Joshua again. After the meeting, Joshua convinced Stephen that he was great at breaking into homes. Together, they brainstormed on how to sneak into houses into richer neighborhoods so that they could increase their payouts. And on the night before targeting the Pettit's home, they ran a test burglary on another home in Cheshire. Joshua showed Stephen just how easy it was to break in while Stephen kept watch outside. After the robbery, this convinced Stephen that they could easily target a family in a rich neighborhood, and it was just a matter of time before they found their next victims. Well, it didn't take long. The next day, Joshua scoped out a local grocery store and spotted a mother and daughter who were Jennifer and Michaela Pettit. But he didn't pick them out because they looked rich. Supposedly, he picked them out because he was attracted to the 11-year-old daughter, Michaela. He then went on to stalk both of them throughout the grocery store and then followed the family van back to their home on Sorghum Mill Drive. He noticed that they had a big house, which he thought meant there was plenty of cash and valuables inside. After noting down their address, he headed home until nightfall. Joshua then got a text from his accomplice, 44-year-old Stephen Hayes. Stephen texted, I'm chomping at the bit to get started. Need a margarita soon. After no response, Stephen then texted, We still on? And Joshua responded, Yes. Stephen asks, Soon? To which Joshua replied, I'm putting the kid to bed. Hold your horses. Stephen replied, Dude, the horses want to get loose. LOL. When Jennifer and Michaela had left the grocery store on that afternoon of July 22nd, 2007, Jennifer gave Bill a call to ask him to pick up some fresh vegetables from the local farmer's market on his way home. When they all got home, Michaela cooked dinner, and the Pettit family spent their evening together like they usually did most Sundays. Meanwhile, they had no idea that a strange man had followed them home, wrote down their address, and then vanished from the neighborhood. Jennifer and her daughters watched the drama TV series Army Wives in the family room, and Bill read the Sunday newspaper on the couch in the sunroom. Around 11 p.m., Jennifer and the daughters headed up to bed. They locked the front and back doors, turned off the lights, and headed upstairs. Bill had already fallen asleep on the couch in the sunroom. Haley then went to her bedroom and shut the door, and Michaela went into her parents' room where she read a book with her mother, and she ended up falling asleep in her parents' bed beside Jennifer. Then between 2 and 3 a.m. in the early morning of July 23, 2007, Bill woke up in a state of confusion. He was still in the sunroom, but he could tell something was wrong. He could feel the Sunday paper still resting on his chest, but he couldn't tell if he was awake or in a dream. Through a thin layer of fabric, he saw a dark figure reaching down toward him, 
Another figure held what looked like a baseball bat. The bat then came down hard on Bill's chest and he rolled off the couch and fell to the floor. And then some sort of cloth bag had been placed over his head so he could barely see. And the figure kept wailing on him with the wooden bat. Several blows struck him in the front and back of the head as he writhed on the ground. When he tried to defend himself, he realized that his arms and legs had been bound with zip ties. The blows from the wooden bat eventually knocked him out for a moment as blood rushed from his head. When he came to, he heard the voices of two people. They demanded to know where the safe was. Confused, Bill told them there was no safe, but they didn't believe him. They calmly and quietly told Bill they wouldn't hurt him or the family as long as he cooperated. As Bill lifted his head from the ground, he could see the faint outlines of the two figures through the thin layer of the fabric around his head, and one of the figures began to move away. As they left, they told the other one that if Bill moved, they'd put two bullets in him. Then the footsteps faded deeper into the house. The intruder moved upstairs where they entered the master bedroom. Michaela was still fast asleep on the bed next to her mother, but soon woke up to the sound of the stranger charging into the bedroom. Bill could faintly hear their interaction. The voice told Jennifer the same thing they told Bill. No one would get hurt as long as they told them where the safe was. The intruder then snatched Michaela and took her into her bedroom where they wrapped a pillowcase over her head. And then they did the same thing with Haley down the hall. Bill could hear his daughter's muffled screams while he was still bound up on the first floor. Badly beaten and tied up, he couldn't do anything to protect his family. The intruder then tied Michaela and Haley to their separate bedposts with rope and then they returned to the master bedroom and did the same to Jennifer. After everyone was bound with ropes and zip ties, Bill could hear the footsteps of the two intruders as they rummaged through the house. The two thieves still looked for the safe, but of course they wouldn't find it because it didn't exist. After not finding anything, the two of them returned to Bill. He heard their footsteps approach and the faint figures reappeared through the fabric bag over his head. They then took a knife and reached down to his ankles where they cut the zip ties that bound his legs. They then lifted him up and dragged him into the kitchen. From there, they found the basement stairs attached to the kitchen, and they dragged Bill down into the unfinished basement. By now, Bill had taken several life-threatening blows to the head and had fallen and out of consciousness several times. When they got him into the basement, he was disoriented and woozy. The men sat him down on an old couch cushion and tied him to a foundational pole. They cut the zip ties that bound his hands and pulled his hands back and zip-tied them to the pole. They did the same with his ankles. If that wasn't enough, they then took a length of rope and tied up his arms and legs. They also took a blanket that was lying on the ground and wrapped it around his head. With the cloth bag and the blanket, now all Bill could see was darkness. He heard the intruders march back up the stairs and continue to rummage through the house. They kept looking for something they would never find. Helpless, Bill listened the best he could to try and gather any information, like their names or any locations that might be important. As he listened, the AC unit kicked on, and he knew it was scheduled to turn on at 5.30 a.m. every day. He also heard the sound of birds chirping outside, so at least he knew it was early morning. As more time passed, he tried to break his binds by moving up and down in the chair. He tried to use the friction against the pole to break the ropes and zip ties. The problem was, he could feel his energy draining. He couldn't see it, but he knew he was losing blood, and he was also on blood-thinning heart medication that made him lose blood even faster. A long while passed and all he could hear upstairs was silence, and the silence was finally broken by the voice of his wife, Jennifer. Bill could hear her talking to one of the intruders. He could tell that they must have been in the kitchen since the door to the basement stairs connected to the kitchen, and from what he could overhear, the intruders were getting more and more frustrated. They were calm at first, but as the hours passed and they failed to find anything of value, their voices grew louder. They had taken all the wallets and purses they could find in the house, Bill had no cash, and Haley had about $100 and a few gift cards from her graduation, but they still couldn't find the stash that they were looking for, and since they were so desperate for money, they even dumped a jar of change into a bag to take with them. While ransacking the house, they discovered a bank statement that showed a balance of around $30,000, and they figured if they couldn't find the money in the house, they would have to get it from the bank. So they needed a change of plans. So they decided that they would force Jennifer to withdraw $15,000 when the bank opened at 9 a.m. By this point, Bill thought it must have been around 6 or 7 a.m. So they'd been waiting around a while until the bank opened, and he kept listening in on their plan. One of them said that they would watch over the house while the other took Jennifer to the bank. While waiting around, one went into the garage and found two empty bottles of washer fluid. They then stole Jennifer's van and drove to the nearby gas station. 
While there, Stephen went inside and was caught on CCTV camera. He gave the cashier about $10 in cash and then went out to fill the two washer fluid bottles up with gas. When he got back from the gas station, the two waited around until about 9 a.m. Then they grabbed Jennifer, dragged her to the car, and drove her to the local Bank of America branch. As Jennifer entered the branch, she was caught on surveillance camera. She can be seen patiently waiting in line before walking up to the next available teller. She tried to remain as calm as possible while asking the teller to withdraw $15,000 from her account. The problem was she didn't have her ID on her. So the teller told her she needed her ID if she wanted to withdraw any money. And since it was a joint bank account she shared with her husband, she needed a bill to be here to approve the transaction. After debating what to do for a moment, Jennifer finally decided to tell the bank employee what was actually going on. She told them that two intruders had broken into her house and demanded money. If she didn't get them the money, they would kill her and her family. After hearing this, the bank teller rushed to the back of the bank to get the manager. And instead of believing her story, they first thought Jennifer might have been trying to deceive the teller so she could steal money from the joint bank account. Jennifer desperately tried to convince them, so she pulled out her wallet, which had no money or ID inside since the intruders had already gone through it. All that was left were a few pictures of her children, which she desperately showed to the bank teller and the manager. As the bank employees looked at the picture, Jennifer told them that if they couldn't get the money, her whole family would die. After a moment, the manager ended up approving the withdrawal, and they gave her all $15,000. Jennifer then left the bank in a hurry with the cash in hand, and immediately after she left, the bank manager called 911. Here's some of that call. We have a lady who is in our bank right now who says that her husband and children are being held at their house. The, the people are in a car outside the bank. She is getting $15,000 to bring out to them that if the police are told, they will kill the children and the husband. The bank manager was even able to catch a glimpse of the man in Jennifer's van, and she could describe to them what they were wearing. The problem was, was the bank manager only described the situation as suspicious activity, which was with a hostage situation. And she told them that the robbers promised not to harm the family as long as Jennifer got them the money. The manager even said that the assailants were being nice. So it wasn't clear exactly what was going on. And like Austin just said, when journalists tried to get a full transcript of the call, a lot of that information has been redacted. So back at Sorghum Mill Drive, the police took the call seriously. Between seven to 10 police and SWAT team members built a perimeter around the neighborhood. They also placed several unmarked cars near the house on Sorghum Mill Drive, which had officers inside, but it had taken a half hour to set up the operation. By the time they had actually checked on the Pettit's house, the van that had been driven to the bank was already back at the property. And from the bank manager's call, the police still believed that the intruders wouldn't hurt the family as long as they got the money. I don't understand how they didn't get the van after it left the bank. Like there had to have been officers close enough to that bank that they could have potentially stopped the van before it got back to the house. Yeah, some reports did claim that police did find the van, but they refused to. And what I, and it's just it's so tragic that the police did not respond to the actual situation that was going down versus the description of what the manager at the bank was saying because it's like it is much more dire than what they even knew and i think i think their idea was that well if this is a hostage situation then we need to kind of be careful with it so we need to kind of take our time with it and potentially negotiate with the hostage takers and i think that was kind of the mindset of the police was like we need to take this seriously as a hostage situation rather than going guns blazing where somebody could potentially get shot or killed we'll kind of take a more passive approach and see if we can't talk these guys down and release the family i think is is what they were thinking but the person who called dispatch did say like hey they promised they wouldn't hurt the family right so i think they were banking on that the whole time which i'm like oh that's a big big gamble to take huge yeah again a lot of the initial information that the police got on the situation was from the bank manager and the bank manager mentioned that as long as these guys got the money they weren't going to hurt the family also the bank manager said that as long as the police weren't called they wouldn't harm the family as well so again it's possible that the police were avoiding the intruders in the house the best they could because they were worried that 
they would just go and kill the family if you know these guys realized that the police were were on them. So their plan was to wait for them to leave the house, barricade the street, and then arrest them. But some officers later admitted that they heard the screams of young girls coming from the house, but they didn't do anything. Supposedly, the house had no blinds on the window, so the police could have easily looked inside. And some reports even claim that the van had been spotted by the police before it got back to the house, but they never pulled the van over. And when asked about the timeline of events, Lieutenant J. Paul Vance of the state police later said that the public shouldn't be concerned about it. Allegedly, the police had already surrounded the house, but refused to do anything beyond that. The police that had first arrived at the scene later said that they were just following protocol and their captain defended them. Back inside the house, the family members were still being taken hostage, and this entire time, Bill was trying to free himself in the basement. He had struggled so much that his hands and wrists were bleeding where the zip ties and rope had cut into his skin. He also had a head wound, which had been bleeding for hours. When the men returned, it was hard for Bill to hear him, but he described hearing thumping noises upstairs. When he screamed, a single voice responded. One of the intruders came down the basement stairs and told him not to worry and that it would all be over in a couple of minutes. He then heard the intruder walk back up the stairs. By now, Bill was convinced that the men were going to kill his entire family. He felt a surge of primal adrenaline, and he was able to break through the bindings that tied him to the chair. He was also able to get his hands free and remove the bag from his head, but his legs were still tied. He used his free hands to climb up the basement stairs with his legs still bound with zip ties. After lifting himself up each individual step, he made it to the kitchen and out through the side door. Once outside, he was able to get over to the next door neighbor's yard and out to the front lawn. And this was only about five minutes after the police had arrived and set up the perimeter. Bill then crawled to the garage and began banging on the garage door. His neighbor, Dave, had lived in the neighborhood for 20 years. And for the last 18 years, Bill and Dave had become good friends. But as Dave looked out of his house and saw Bill lying there on his driveway, he didn't even recognize his good friend. Bill had been beaten so badly that Dave thought it was a complete stranger. So he yelled over to him, Can I help you? And Bill yelled back, This is Bill. Call the police. Call the police. So here's that 911 call. I got Bill Pettit here who's hurt, my neighbor. He's at your house? Yes, he's right here. What's crazy is that this entire time, this is all going down. The police in unmarked cars saw the whole thing unfold, but they didn't know what to do. They claimed that they didn't know if Bill was one of the intruders or one of the victims, but one of the officers eventually ran up to Bill and kept his distance. He unholstered his pistol, aimed it at Bill, and asked him what was going on. Bill told him that his family was still inside the house. On the other side of the property, police watched as a man holding a bag sprinted out of the house and into the family van. And then a second figure wearing a hat ran out of the house soon after. One of the burglars hopped into the driver's seat and the other into the passenger side. With the pedal to the floor, the van backed down the driveway at full speed and smashed into one of the unmarked cars. Then the driver put the van into drive and fled full speed down the street until they were out of sight. Soon after, the sound of crunching metal and shattered glass echoed through the neighborhood. The van had crashed into one of the police cars that had formed a barricade across the street. After the accident, police pulled both suspects from the van and arrested them. This all happened within five minutes of the men running out of the house. Within that short amount of time, the entire house on Sorghum Mill Drive had gone up in flames. Fire burst from the first and second story windows and black smoke filled the sky above. I don't understand a lot of things about the police's response to this particular situation. But Bill? They were confused by Bill? I don't get it. He's crawling out of the basement. Bleeding from his head. Profusely from his head. Yeah. And his feet are tied, crawling on the ground, basically, hobbling on the ground. And they approach him like a suspect. Like, it doesn't make any sense. Like, no. wouldn't you think that that's a victim, most likely? Right. Were they still under the mindset that, like, we should keep our, don't blow our cover because we don't want anything more drastic to happen inside? Was that what, was, what they were thinking? I don't know. I don't, I honestly don't know what they were thinking. Yeah, I, I don't, I, I don't think they really even knew what they were responding to. I didn't, I don't think they really knew how to respond to it. I mean, you got to think too, this is a Cheshire likely hasn't seen a lot of hostage situations in True. its past. And so they don't know what they're dealing with. They don't know how many suspects they're dealing with either. But at the same time, it's like, the amount of police presence that were there they have SWAT team members there and this is what blows my mind is like 
especially seeing Bill and seeing the state that Bill's in, doesn't it register in your mind like, holy shit, they, there could be more people in there with similar injuries or worse. The SWAT team is literally for these types of situations. And I, and I get that they were like, it's sort of a hostage situation, but at the same time, it's really not a hostage situation because they're at the residence of this, of this family. So clearly you would put two and two together and be like, these, these suspects invaded this residence and are now barricaded inside. And yeah, from what I know, I, I mean, did they even try to engage contact with these suspects? You know, a lot of times they'll over a bullhorn or something like that, try to like make contact, bring them out. I think it was Jennifer's sister brought up the fact that she's like, Jennifer never put up blinds in the house. So simply if they had just maybe looked in the windows, they could have seen what the hell was going on. Well, there's, I highly doubt that there was not a sniper there on scene. Right. So why wouldn't you, I mean, I've seen other situations like this play out where, you know, you create the perimeter around the residence and then you've got, you've got snipers on each side of the house looking through the windows with scopes and you can actually, and don't, doesn't somebody have a pair of binoculars even to like right. look through the windows and see like what's and maybe they were not able to see anybody because they're in somewhere out of view. But at the same time, you just think, I just don't understand how Steven and Joshua get out of the house and manage to get into the car and drive away. The police were that far away that they didn't meet. Like you would think they would immediately intervene and would have arrested them with that before they ever got into the car. Yeah. They were like still trying to keep cover i don't get it it's it's bizarre i mean it just to me like i would think in in other situations i've seen you show up to a scene like this and there's potentially you know and you've got the message from the bank manager that there's a there's a family being held hostage like this is a a large enough home where i feel like you could make entry somewhere into the home with the swat team and potentially take these guys out before they ever even know that you're there and, and that's the thing this is a fairly large home i think it's like an eight bedroom home so it's like there's got to be a point in this house if you if you assess the situation fast enough that you can figure out a way into the house without being you know being heard that's why they have smoke grenades concussion grenade things, and and that's that's what you do you know yeah. and you render them you know incapacitated incapacitated yeah. temporarily and then and then t you know without any bullets being exchanged so it's just like the fact that it's just a lot of sitting around watching and not taking action just tells me that the leadership at the top either didn't know what the hell they were doing or were, were playing it as safe as possible for them and and their officers or they just had no idea they're just training wise had no clue what to do they're just like oh what do we do how do we approach this and it was just all taking too long it blows my mind and i know for the family it's to this day it's i mean angering because what's crazy is that the police have never come out and publicly even talked about their approach about you know have never discussed why they did things that the way that they did because they know they know they fucked up yeah with this because now these guys are gone and the house is in flames when you could have potentially intervened before it got to that point yep and they didn't yeah and yeah like the lieutenant said he's like oh the public shouldn't be concerned about the timeline of events. Yeah. Okay, sure, dude. Yeah. Our tax dollars only pay for the police department and yet they don't want any accountability or told, you know, any sort of transparency. Right. It's just I mean, that's that's what's wrong with with police in America right there. So, Bill gets rushed to the hospital and the swelling from his wounds had made him unrecognizable. I mean, really really bad. And we can't even put a lot of these images in um, at least a YouTube video because it's just they're so bloody and just horrific but he lost nearly seven pints of blood which is 70% of all the blood in the average human body so it's it's honestly incredible that Bill survived no that's crazy and made full recovery yeah most people would have passed out and died by then and that's where that adrenaline you know that primal adrenaline kicks in and, and potentially saves your life and and obviously too knowing that you've got to somehow get to your family and your family you are separated from your family i mean you would want to use every ounce of energy you have left to try to try to get to them and that's exactly what he did but when doctors checked out his wounds they realized that he had been hit several times in the front and the back of his head the intruders had swung the baseball bat as hard as they could right into his skull 
so obviously it was a miracle that he lived at all. Jennifer's parents, Richard and Maryville Hawk, rushed to the hospital once they heard about what had happened. We went to the hospital and got to see Bill for the first time. He was badly beaten and he tried to apologize to us for not saving our daughter and, uh, and our grandchildren. And we had to convince him that he was in no condition to be able to save anyone, and we were grateful that he was alive. That he was alive. Back at the house, firefighters got the house fire under control. The white siding around the windows were charred black, and the inside of the house had been severely damaged by the fire, but the house was still standing. But sadly, Jennifer, Haley, and Michaela were still inside the house the entire time it was engulfed in flames. And by the time the fire was extinguished, the insides of the house had been hollowed out. Ash, soot, and debris filled each room. The kitchen cabinets were scorched black, and the living room walls crumbled. And the insulation poured out from between the studs. All of the colorful paint and furniture that once filled the house was now a shade of black. Upon arrival at the victim's residence, the first officer observed two male subjects exit private residence and also observed the private residence fully engulfed in flame. The suspect vehicle rammed the Cheshire police officer's car and continued on Sorghum Mill Road. As for Jennifer, Haley, and Michaela, the remains were unrecognizable. They found Jennifer's remains tied to the living room couch. Ligature marks covered her arms and legs like she had been tied up, but most of her body had been burned beyond recognition. Her larynx, also known as her voice box, had also been broken. There was no trace of carbon monoxide or soot in her lungs, which suggested that she had been strangled to death before the fire. There were also signs that she had been sexually assaulted before her death. As for her daughters, they had both died from smoke inhalation. Haley, the oldest, had been able to free herself from her restraints after being tied to her bed. She had escaped her bedroom on the second floor and made it to the stairway before collapsing. As for Michaela, the youngest, she was discovered still bound to her bed frame. Her autopsy revealed that she had been brutally raped before her death. Both the daughter's official cause of death was smoke inhalation, but they also might have burned to death in the house fire. With both suspects in custody, Joshua was the first to talk with police about what had happened. Today's date is July 23rd, 2007. Statement is taking place at the Cheshire Police Department headquarters. Joshua, comma, suggest, do you know why you're here? For a uh, home invasion gone terribly wrong. Okay. And you went to stop and shop in Cheshire. I was waiting for a contractor uh, to make payment. While waiting, I saw a mother and a daughter. For whatever reason, I chose to follow the mom and the daughter um, to their house and saw that they lived in a very nice house. I thought it would be nice to be there someday. And Mr. Hayes and I made our way over to the house and donned face masks and put on rubber gloves and. We noticed that the father was uh, sleeping downstairs. I could see Mr. Hayes in the window uh, motioning to, to strike him and get it over with. And, uh, I hit him in the head with a baseball bat. And he let off this unworthy scream. And just kept hitting him until he finally packed up into the corner of the couch. And, uh, Mr. Hayes and I. Uh, proceeded up the stairway. Mr. Hayes put his hand over mom's mouth and shook her uh, gently awake. I followed suit with the youngest uh, the daughters. I tied her feet and Mr. Hayes tied her hands. He put um, pillowcases over the occupants' heads. Um, yeah. yeah, so that they couldn't see us. And then went into KK's room and sat down and we were talking about school and summer plans and I got her a glass of water. KK, uh, obviously she told you her 
nickname or whatever is KK, or you made that up? No, that's the name that both her sister and her mother uh, referred to her as. No, one thing led to another, and uh, I ended up performing oral sex on KK. You performed oral sex on KK? On okay, KK. Okay. Her hands were tied with her feet were Did you take pictures of her? Uh, I did, yes. I had let her get dressed again, but before she did that, she uh, asked if she could take a shower. Now, you said you let her get dressed again. How How was it she came upon being undressed? Because you originally said she was dressed. I had uh, I used a pair of scissors and had cut her, her shirt off and her skirt off. And uh, he had the money in his hands. He uh, says, uh, very matter of fact, thing, okay, you're, you're ready. We gotta, we have to kill them and burn the house down. I'm like, I'm not killing anyone. There's no way. Well, then, you know, I'll kill the two daughters and you can kill the mom. I was like, I'm not killing anyone. No one's dying by my hand today. And finally, he was like, fuck it, I'll, I'll take care of all three of them. As you just saw in those clips, Joshua was using Michaela's nickname that her family actually used for her, which was KK, which is just so fucked up Gross. and yeah. disgusting that he was talking to her with this term of endearment that her family uses. And it's just scary to know that he knew this, somehow knew this about her, been watching them enough that he picked up KK. What police later realized were that his confessions were mostly lies. As for Stephen, he refused to talk at first, but as the hours passed, both Joshua and Stephen began to turn on each other in separate interrogation rooms. They each gave their own versions of what happened, and to no one's surprise, they even tried to put the blame on each other. Investigators needed to understand exactly what happened in the house. And according to them, Joshua and Stephen's initial plan was to invade the home, tie up the family members, steal what they could, and leave without harming anyone. The only credible witness to the crime was Bill, but he had been bound with a bag over his head the entire time. Plus, the house had gone up in flames, so it was hard for forensics to investigate the crime scene. The crime had to be pieced together with an injured eyewitness who couldn't see during the attacks, and two lying suspects that blamed each other, as well as a crime scene that had been destroyed. Plus, the police were tight-lipped about what went on that day, and many refused to talk about the timeline of events. By November 7, 2007, the court put a gag order on police lawyers and eyewitnesses and they were barred from talking with the media after the interrogations forensics and interviews this was the timeline of events that were eventually pieced together so around 2 or 3 a.m on the night of july 22 2007 stephen and joshua snuck into the pettit's backyard where they found a wooden baseball bat that they decided to use as a weapon when they approached the house they cut the phone lines from the outside and then broke in through the cellar door in the backyard that connected to the basement. The lock on the cellar door had been broken for some time, but the family never got around to fixing it. Once the two of them were inside, they snuck from the basement and into the kitchen. From there, they noticed that Bill was sleeping in the sunroom, which was towards the front of the house. They put a cloth bag over his head, bound him, and then beat him with the bat, and then dragged him to the basement. After tying up the rest of the family, they ransacked the house looking for money and valuables. After finding almost nothing, they eventually came across the bank statement letter, so they made the change in their plans. Stephen then left the house to fill the two jugs with gasoline where he was caught on security cameras. Supposedly, the plan was to set fire to the house to get rid of any evidence that was left behind. According to Stephen, they planned to move all the family members away from the house before lighting it on fire. Do you even think that's remotely true? I don't believe anything that these guys say at all. Agreed. Because they're clearly trying to Put blame on each other but I, I think there was you know they might have gone back and forth in the moment to try to figure out but the fact that they grabbed a baseball bat and used it tells me that violence was always an option for them yeah and as the events unfold in here they start realizing that you know removing the family is not going to be enough to cover our crimes so after Stephen came back with the containers filled with gas, he then took Jennifer to the bank. While there, he noticed that Jennifer had stalled for as long as she could. Jennifer was hoping the longer she stayed in the bank, the police might show up eventually, but they never did. 
and Jennifer probably knew she couldn't wait too long. She worried that Stephen would call Joshua, who was back at the house, and he would do something drastic. Which, unknown to her, Joshua had already committed a horrific crime back at the home. As Stephen waited in the car outside of the bank, Joshua called and let Stephen know that he had just raped 11-year-old Michaela, and he had even taken pictures of his crime on his cell phone. Once Stephen and Jennifer returned to the house with the money, the nightmare still wasn't over. According to Stephen, Joshua then pressured him into raping Jennifer. That's like the biggest load of shit I've ever heard. No, this was always the plan. And while she was being raped on the living room floor, Joshua came in and said that Bill had just escaped from the basement. After hearing this, Stephen wrapped his hands around Jennifer's throat, broke her larynx, and strangled her to death. And then he doused her in gasoline. He then rushed upstairs and went into each bedroom where he drenched the two daughters with gasoline while they were still tied to their bed frames. After pouring out the rest of the gas around the bedroom floors and through the hallways, he ignited the gas. The house went up in flames as Joshua and Stephen ran outside. According to Stephen, this wasn't the initial plan, and he blamed Joshua for escalating the situation. Do you think they went in? I, I guess the big question is, do you think they went in to kill this family? Oh man, that's that's the the toughest question I think there is here. Yeah. I mean, I think they clearly thought they were well off and they were going to find all this valuables and stuff, but I don't, I don't know. I, I really don't know if they were planning on killing them or not. It sure seemed like they were prepared to do it yep. and it wasn't that hard of a decision for them. I mean, I go back and forth like who whose idea was it to burn the house down? And I think of Joshua's past and the fact that he had experience with arson before that maybe it was his idea to actually burn the house down and then after they realized that bill escaped which which is like they knew bill escaped but they did put a bag over his head so were they worried that bill would identify them and knew enough about who they were that they would get caught if they didn't just take care of the whole thing? i don't know yeah because that that's I, I think there is probably parts of what really happened that we just will never know yeah i think the question is basically like was it premeditated or not which in the grand scheme of things i don't think matters too much because it's so horrific what happened but um that was at least the big question in the court case was did they go plan this the whole time or is or this a robbery this gone like, wrong yeah yeah shouldn't matter either way yeah it's they premeditated to burning, you know, Jennifer and the two girls. So they knew that what exactly that was going to entail. So after seven hours of the home invasion, taking hostages, beating Bill, raping Michaela and Jennifer, and lighting the house on fire with the mother and daughter still inside, both Stephen and Joshua were filing in custody around 10 a.m. after crashing into the police car. After the smoke cleared, many began questioning how Bill was the only one to escape. And during Stephen and Joshua's confession, they actually claimed that Bill was in on it, which is just sick. Yeah. Joshua had also kept a journal where he wrote down notes about all of his home invasions. He wrote the journals because he was planning to make money off of a book written about the murders. But prison officials soon confiscated the journals. For the Pettit family home invasion, Joshua had a lot to say. In addition to calling Bill a coward for not protecting his family, he also said that they had caught Haley with a cell phone twice. Each time she tried calling for help, but they stopped her before she could. Joshua claimed that Haley was braver than her father, and he believed Bill could have stopped them if he really wanted. During the interrogation, Stephen claimed that Bill helped plan the whole thing, which no way, there's no evidence, no. there's nothing, it's just a bold-faced lie to try yeah. to... And I think this is a good way to realize these guys are so full of shit oh yeah like they're trying to pin it on bill one of the victims they're like oh, no he was in on it the whole time just a straight up lie that is kind of so obvious if you're going to try and lie your way out of something this to me was like the biggest tell so the plan was to basically nearly kill bill with a baseball bat to try to make it look like it was it, it makes no sense yeah. whatsoever this is just a a frantic way to try to pass blame onto somebody else to hopefully get a lesser sentence i guess is what yeah. they're hoping because i mean they know that they are in, in obviously serious trouble but they they've likely got the death penalty headed their way so 
when you get desperate and you don't want to die, you start saying crazy shit like this. Yep. So after their confessions, both Joshua and Stephen pled guilty, hoping that they would get life in prison instead of a death sentence, but the state wouldn't agree with the terms of their confession. Plus, Bill was one of the loudest voices, arguing that both of them should be put to death. Here's Bill's thoughts on a death penalty. Death penalty is clearly a deterrent because the person who's committed the violent crime can no longer commit it again. So that person is removed from society. And I think they've forfeited their right to live in a civil, civilized society. And uh, the taking of a, a life, the opponents like to say it's a murder by the government. But that's a semantic uh, issue because murder is the unlawful taking. We have laws set down for, for certain reasons and certainly the defense attorneys spend lots of time and lots of our money using the law to their benefit and uh, the law says that for certain crimes there's there's an ultimate penalty and society's believed in that for thousands of years. What do you think of that take? Um, I'm on board. Uh, my biggest, I, we've talked about the death penalty before, but I think my biggest gripe with uh putting someone to death is not the act of putting someone to death it's that the state is putting someone to death and i just don't trust the state so i think that's like my bottom line as succinctly as i can put it i'm all for scraping people off the face of the earth who don't deserve to be here in this case these are like the poster yeah, children absolutely. for the death penalty absolutely. you know but my gripe is more with the the system of putting people to death and not so much putting people to death. Yeah, I agree with you with the the system. I mean, I think if in a perfect world, the system would, would be fair and just, but we know that that's not the case. And so if you take that into consideration, obviously there's room for error and for people to receive the death penalty that are either innocent or don't deserve to receive the death penalty. But, you know, the law is law and there's not sort of like an in-between a lot of the times and so like in cases where it's like clear cut these guys did this they did these heinous crimes there should be no question on whether or not they're guilty or not this is the punishment for those crimes and i think if you can prove beyond a reasonable doubt that these people did the crimes i think that if the law allows for that to be death they should be given death i mean i think dr pettit's explanation is pretty spot on which the interviewer asked prior to that you know there's been a lot of studies that suggest that the death penalty is not a deterrent for criminals because a lot of them are sociopathic and they don't they don't care or think about the consequences of their crimes and i agree with that to some extent but at the same time i do believe that there's just there's a point beyond where there's no return and you, once you cross that line it does not matter you you did something so heinous and evil that there is no coming back from it you're doling out death to others and it's like you know is it more fair that let's say if you don't agree that the state shouldn't take their lives well should bill be able to take their lives if he wanted to That's would that good, be fair and just you open up a question of basically would what would the purpose of bill killing these two men mean in the hypothetical revenge right? Right. It's revenge, yeah, and so revenge, it's like yeah. obviously, if you you can think what you want about revenge, and you know, obviously, it comes down to philosophical beliefs and things like that. But it's like, I know for me personally, if this were me, they would have to probably like restrain me because I would probably go kill these guys, honestly. And that's like, honest to God, what I would do in this situation. If it were if it were my family, I would probably I would even care the con because you know what. For me, it would be like, I would rather sacrifice my life. And if I spend the rest of my life in prison, so be it. Because I couldn't stand living on the outside every single day, knowing that these two evil motherfuckers are going to be in prison and they're going to be living out their life. And yeah, they're going to deal with the, you know, the haunting of the things that happen. But it's like, what you find is that a lot of these guys that get life in prison they end up like figuring out some way to move past the trauma and you know a lot of them like to claim oh i found religion and god and i'm saved and you know i'm i'm a good person but it's like no you cannot take back there is no taking back what you did 
you will forever be an evil individual. And so allowing them the opportunity to reach that point in their lives where they have moved past the horrific things that they've done and be able to like live in somewhat of a good headspace at all or think in their minds that I'm a good person now to me is not fair, not just. And therefore, I think it's an absolute deterrent if criminals know that you will face a violent death as well if you dole it out you're going to get it back and i think if they knew that and it was swift and not this big long drawn out process with appeals and all this stuff i think in these the, cases and that's, that's the, the biggest problem right yes. is that it's not swift right it takes a really long time a lot of taxpayer money right years of appeals right and that's why a lot of people are against capital punishment and i get that but it's like we have to we have to redo the system because you know what all hundred years or maybe a little bit more than that it was like you're getting hanged yeah you're like, done yeah. you're getting hanged the next day yeah and especially if it's like concrete this is what happened you have eyewitnesses you you see it go down like what's the point of like going through this long legal court system process at that point when you're ultimately going to reach the, the result that is not fair or just for the crimes that were committed and they are allowed to live years and years and years yet you took years and years and years away from this family and you took his loved ones and to me it's just like life in prison for these guys is not a fair and just punishment for the crimes that were committed and it's very clear that they committed these crimes yeah i think that's a key point too is that it, there is no doubt in right. anyone's mind that these guys right did it or didn't do it right we're we're all on board with that they did which is i think why this case specifically is more of a a poster child so to speak for capital punishment is because it's so it's a hundred percent true that these guys had right did it but I, I don't think all cases are like that that's the tough part though is it's like you are you're holding the same standards to people come you know suspected of committing different crimes and different circumstances and and you know it the amount of evidence that has to be presented in court and the amount you know to put the case together to actually convict somebody and, and dole out the death sentence is a huge task in itself but it's like in a lot of cases you could have shoddy police work that right, ends up yeah. pointing to the complete wrong person and ultimately the police you could say are the ones responsible for that person receiving the death death penalty because they it could be racial bias it could be it could be just crappy investigation skills but and that's the part that's hard. I think I think we it's like why are laws so like rigid and so set in stone? Like why isn't this a much more fluid system? Why isn't there more of a you know, why is it up to you know a judge to decide what the sentence you know, why isn't there more why isn't the family involved in being a part of that decision? And obviously they let them, you know, make their case to the judge oftentimes at sentencing hearings, things like that. But it's like it seems to me that in this these particular types of situations where it's like there is no doubts at all there's evidence beyond a reasonable doubt why can't we just make this an easy process why why do they get to then use all these loopholes in the law and things like that and yeah. draw this out i think that's harder for a family to to deal with i think as far as this case goes we're on the same page i would love if we could just sit these guys in chairs inject them yeah and be done with this yeah yeah it's very frustrating before their trials, the Connecticut General Assembly sent legislation to abolish the state's death penalty in 2009. Governor Mary Jody Rell vetoed the bill in the end, and she cited these Cheshire murders as the biggest factor in her decision. She said, quote, certain crimes are so heinous, so depraved, that society is best served by imposing the ultimate sanction on the criminal." Uh, within days of these murders, she also put, uh, she ordered electronic monitoring on all paroled burglars. And by September, she banned parole for violent offenders and ordered reviews for all convicts currently on parole. So definitely some damage control on her end. Um, the director board of paroles, Bob Farr, said that there were no flags when it came to Stephen and Joshua. They were both employed. They had passed their drug tests and they both had a place to live. And as far as the parole board was concerned, that was, that was nothing seemed off with their cases. That was it. That's insanity to me. And again, this goes back to the system. I think our parole system is jacked. Yeah, It is completely jacked. Cause you see the people 
that commit these horrific crimes and murders over and over and over again are people are habitual offenders that that get out over and over again and maybe maybe it's for lesser crimes that they're getting out for but when you see a habitual re- offender that has got a rap sheet of 20 30 burglaries that is somebody who's going to go right back to doing that and whether or not they're they're passing drug tests and they have somewhere stable to live that doesn't mean anything at all they should all be monitored yeah. honestly they should all be monitored and put on house arrest first at the, the very least for a certain amount of time to keep track of them and if they if they even do so much as like step over the line they should be thrown back into a cell and it's, i don't i don't know the exact job of of what who does what on a parole board a part of me thinks are they just pushing papers they see oh yeah non-violent of offenders burglary whatever yeah the, they're fine and knowing how manipulative both steven and joshua was you know how oh they got good behavior probably in all their sentences you know they could manipulate the system and make them think like oh that, these are reformed yeah, finally. Yeah. You know? and then you and again like the parole office is absolutely understaffed you got one parole officer for you know 50 different you know individuals and so there's just no i'm just like in the age of technology you know we got self-driving cars out here (laughs) we got you know all this fancy fancy tech everywhere why the hell does our criminal justice system not have this tech implemented anywhere right with our prisons our jails monitoring inmates to people getting out on on release to even in the court system itself we still have a person transcribing by hand yeah the freaking trials and stuff old it's school, like it's yeah. it's all old school it's all outdated it needs to be updated i mean do we even need a judge why do we have a judge why don't we you know we could have ai be the judge have an ai judge who has no you know predisposition or bias someone made a really good comment because we had talked about ai yeah. in court before and i read someone's comment i think it was on a, uh i can't remember the case but someone brought up a good point where ai is technically it's just a conglomeration you know, fed, a con- fed conglomer- information from humans yeah exactly so there almost would be inherent bias still because the ai is learning from us potentially but i think if you you could do it in a way where you could you give them the information without human input because like especially when it comes to the law right the law is written by humans but the way that it's interpreted could be interpreted differently by ai as opposed to a human interpreting it so i think if you were to obviously if you were you know feeding you know i'm a judge and i'm feeding the ai all this information you're going to give it those you know those human aspects to it but if you just give it purely the data and, and the information itself and the laws itself and allow it to interpret it itself i wonder how that would look it would be really interesting to see this experimented with and and how it would it would turn out because yeah i I agree with that to some extent and and obviously a lot of ai is you know you're inputting um code and stuff like that from a human and you're giving it its data and stuff to work off of but i think what if you just gave ai on a very basic level all the laws and information and history even of of the court system and allow it to come to its own cl- conclusion and, and what that would look like so when, i mean i'm not an ai expert so i could right, be right, completely right. misspeaking here but from what i do understand is that there probably is a way to do that without human bias coming into the equation there yeah and i think one of my biggest fears of not even just ai but we see it here uh the director board of paroles is everyone wants to kick the can down the road and blame someone else so even even after it seemed like they had screwed up here bob farr was still like look there were no red flags we did nothing wrong well why didn't the cops go in when and then everyone wants to start blaming everyone else and i i fear what if ai starts doing that what if the ai judge starts going well check out the ai well in in would they have that same that would and that's the thing is ai gonna end up thinking like a human or is it gonna think like something smarter than a human hopefully and i think that's the question is like we don't know yet how i like to think that ai is going to be smarter than us it's certainly going to have the computing power to be smarter than us so i like to believe that would it would have the ability to think beyond the way that we would think as humans and look at even the bigger picture here and that it's important to be fair and just because 
humans were kind of single track minded sometimes and we're like kind of tunnel vision and i feel like individuals in the legal system are getting tunnel vision on a case or the media isn't influencing the case oh absolutely and so yeah. if you were to eliminate that and ai doesn't care about anything going on by that it's just purely looking at what's um the data that it's received and and again it, there would have to be a data stream that is has checks and balances and, and comes from reliable places and it wasn't being fed data that was unreliable and that's that's a whole other thing but i think there might be a way to 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 get to a point where because it's just like like you just said a lot of it and we see this so many times over and over again nobody wants to look bad egos yeah. on egos on egos on egos from the judges to the attorneys to the prosecutors to the investigators to the police to everybody's got an ego in the criminal justice system it seems like and so nobody wants to be wrong nobody wants to admit they're wrong so this this constant cover up of information and protection of individuals just happens over and over again and i mean this is something i believe is i think i don't think police officers should get immunity i think you should be able to sue and charge a police officer if they do something wrong or um, another officer observes another officer doing you know breaking the law or you know in certain cases with uh types of interactions with the public you know you could try you know if they violate your rights are brutal and do some police brutality on you that they should not have immunity under the law uh for those things or not understanding the law in, in the right way and not enforcing it the correct way police are protected right now it's very difficult to go after a police officer in those certain types of cases and so yeah, if you remove that from them and they're open to being sued charged and don't have that protection under the law anymore i think you start seeing some the, change some yeah. major change because yeah. then it's gonna weed out the bad ones real quick yeah. i mean you're preaching to the choir here i'm i'm totally on board <laughs> with that yeah the the police as far as i'm concerned is just a state-run mob at this point I know that's a pretty hot in, take, in most but. cases, and I mean, I've I've met a few good ones over the years, and there For are sure. there there's good ones sprinkled in, but there's yeah, a definitely. lot of it's it's especially the guys at the top who have been you know have been a part of this culture that the is so men. toxic, yeah, yeah, for so many years. But anyways, getting back to Stephen, so Stephen's trial began in October of 2010. His defense didn't even argue against his involvement in the crime. He admitted to raping Jennifer, dousing them all in gas, and lighting the house on fire. So Stephen's defense was that Joshua was really the mastermind behind the crimes and that it was in fact Joshua who coerced Stephen into you know, doing this home invasion with him. During the trial, Stephen also told the court that he was so filled with guilt that he had tried to kill himself two times while in jail, and he also had a reoccurring nightmare of his own daughter burning alive. The suicide attempts and Stephen's poor health caused the trial to be delayed several times. But the prosecutors then brought forward a witness, a corrections department supervisor, and she claimed that Stephen had faked his suicide attempts. Stephen even told the supervisor that he was going to use the medical documents to prove that he felt guilty about the murders. Again, this was all just an act to try and avoid the death penalty. Stephen had been charged with 16 crimes, and by the end he was found guilty of 15. When the jury recommended a death sentence, Stephen smiled in court, and in December of 2010, Stephen apologized to the family before saying, Death for me will be a welcome relief, and I hope it will bring some peace and comfort to those who I have hurt so much. The presiding judge, John Blue, imposed six death sentences, one for each capital crime Stephen had committed. He then added a sentence of 106 years for the other crimes of home invasion, kidnapping, burglary, and assault. The judge told Stephen that this was a sentence you wrote for yourself in flames. The official execution date was scheduled for May 27, 2011, so really not that long, long after. Here's Bill's statement after the sentencing. We are satisfied that the defendant has been judged to be the murderer, the rapist, and criminal that he is. And now he's been condemned to the ultimate penalty. We certainly have been criticized over the years that this is vengeance and bloodlust, but this is really about justice. We uh, want to go forward with the Pettit Family Foundation. and So for the first time in state history, the Connecticut State Judicial Branch offered post-traumatic stress assistance to jurors who served in the triple homicide trial. 
During the trial, they had to look at countless disturbing images while listening to grisly testimonies for two months. These pictures have never been released to the public. Bill also had to relive the attacks during the trial because he was a key witness. As for Joshua, his trial began in October of 2011. Joshua was quick to blame his upbringing, his sexual assault, and the lack of counseling for what happened. He also said he never planned on what happened to the Pettit family in their home, except for robbing them. But the prosecutors brought forward the pictures that he had taken on his phone after he raped 11-year-old Michaela. In his journal, he later wrote about how he was planning on using the images to blackmail her parents, and this was enough. The juror saw Joshua for who he truly was. On top of all of this, the prosecution brought forward Joshua's journal. In the notebook, he tried to blame Stephen for everything, especially the fire. But the prosecution argued Joshua did nothing to stop the fire and was a willing participant in the three murders. So on October 3rd, 2011, Joshua was found guilty. In January 2012, the judge sentenced him to death by lethal injection. During the hearing, he said, I will never find peace within. My life will be a continuation of the hurt I caused. The clock is now ticking and I owe a debt I cannot repay. His execution date was set for July 20th, 2012. So with that being said, if you remove the appeals process that they allow, these guys would have been executed within a year or two. I think even when the judge doled out the execution dates, he said he kind of gave a little note. He's like realizing that the appeals process will lengthen this right. by, by quite a bit. And that's where the, that's where this just goes completely wrong. Is that it's going to take years and years and years because they'll just keep appealing it. You get so many appeals yep. and it'll just get dragged out. When Bill Pettit was asked if the death penalty would give him closure on his family's murder, he said, Whoever came up with the concept of closure is an imbecile. There is never closure. There is a hole. A hole with jagged edges and over time, the edges may smooth out a little bit, but the hole is in your heart and the hole in your soul is still there. Although Stephen was scheduled for execution in 2011 and Joshua in 2012, their dates were continuously delayed by the appeals process. It was projected that the cost of the death penalty process for both of them would cost around $7 million, and the state of Connecticut had only executed one prisoner since 1960. That prisoner was a serial killer named Michael Bruce Ross. He murdered eight girls and women between the ages of 14 and 25, and he raped seven of them. He later confessed to the murders and was convicted of four of them and then sentenced to death. He spent almost 18 years on death row before his execution in May 2005. And as far as I understand, this was the last guy that was executed in Connecticut. He basically like begged them yeah. to kill him. Yeah. And that's the thing is like, even if you beg and you say, please kill me, they will not do it. It still took him 18 years. It has to go through row. this long process. It just makes no sense. It's like, what? Wh why? Yeah. Like, why? That's where all the money gets spent. And then not to mention housing this inmate and, you know, food and supplies and this and that. And just, you know, like the prison's already overcrowded as it is. You know what I mean? It's just like, you know, I won't even get started on that rant. But yeah, it's it's absurd. In October of 2011, letters that had been written by Stephen and sent to a woman named Lynn in Wilson, North Carolina, were intercepted by the Department of Corrections. And in these letters, Stephen Hayes admitted to killing 17 people in New England between the early 1980s and 2007. In one of the letters he wrote, I was driving home from a bar when I noticed this girl hitchhiking at the entrance to the highway. She was short, hot, and the perfect victim. He then wrote about how he kidnapped the woman, took her back to a hotel, sexually assaulted her, and then strangled her to death. In other letters, Stephen described raping dozens of women after giving them date rape drugs. In another attack, he claimed he filmed one of the abductions before tying the victim to a bed all weekend and then killing her. He claimed he had 16 hours of video footage of the rape and murder. All the victims were supposedly between the ages of 14 and 25. And Stephen said he had kept trophies from each one. In one of his letters, he mentioned his accomplice Joshua and said, I've searched my whole life for someone who could embrace and had the capacity for evil as I possess. I thought I finally found it in Josh. But events show Josh while he had the proper evil intent, lacked in most serious aspects, commitment, and control. In one of the letters, Stephen told Lynn to hold on to the letters because they might be worth millions one day. These crimes were never investigated because investigators believe Stephen was exaggerating his crimes. So do you think he was exaggerating the crimes? Who knows? I know I, there's the, what is it, Ted Bundy, who, you know, got a lot of attention while in prison. It's Ted Bundy. It's clear really. that that's, a ploy here for sure yeah so i thought that was kind of 
what he was trying to do. He's like getting attention in prison, so he's trying to send out. You got to remember, letters. this guy is like Ted Bundy, a master manipulator. Exactly. Yeah. So he obviously knew that if he wrote all this heinous shit in this letter, that he knows that they review the mail, so that's going to get pulled, and he hoped that investigator. And, and the fact that the police just basically kind of dismiss all this kind of shows that they they probably like looked into it for a second like there's no way this guy's full of shit yeah yeah. he's just trying to get attention and maybe trying to speed up the process or something so as the years passed it looked less and less likely that steven and joshua would be put to death by 2015 the connecticut supreme court abolished the death penalty and vacated both joshua's and steven's sentences and instead of death they were both sentenced to six consecutive life terms in prison On August 16, 2016, they were both moved to separate state prisons in Pennsylvania. Two days later, Joshua tried to hang himself in his cell, and then after that he wanted a retrial, saying that there was too much prejudice against him in the previous trial. He also claimed that there were police recordings that raised questions about the credibility of their testimonies during the trial. These recordings had been destroyed by a lightning strike in 2010, but backups were discovered in 2014. Eventually in 2019, it was announced that this case would be heard by the Connecticut Supreme Court. In 2021, the court rejected the appeal in a 7-0 decision. Joshua then appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court, but they declined. As for Stephen, he has never appealed his life sentences. In 2019, Stephen declared he was diagnosed with sexual identity disorder when he was 16. Stephen said his family never acknowledged it and it was never treated. Stephen then began hormone treatment therapy in prison and changed their name to Linda. So Stephen is now her dead name and her name is now Linda. So both Joshua age 42 and Linda who's now age 62 are still incarcerated in two separate medium security prisons to this day. After the death of his family, Bill Pettit created the Michaela Rose Pettit Scholarship Fund and the Haley's Hope and Michaela's Miracle MS Memorial Fund. On January 6, 2008, over 130,000 Luminaria candles were lit throughout Cheshire during a fundraiser called Cheshire Lights of Hope. They raised over $100,000 for MS and paid tribute to the Pettit family. That same year, the Pettit family home was demolished and turned into a memorial. The horrific nature of the case made waves through the nation. I mean, this was like an international story. In 2010, the family story was covered on Dateline NBC and the Oprah Winfrey Show. And like I've kind of referenced throughout this whole episode, in 2013, HBO released a documentary titled The Cheshire Murders that covered the case. Bill also started the Pettit Family Foundation, which focuses on raising money for students, especially young women who have an interest in science. Here's a clip of Bill talking about the foundation. It's essentially to help out people with uh, chronic illnesses, which was a a, a nod to Haley, who was accepted at Dartmouth and wanted to major in uh, biology and consider medicine or other careers, and to help people affected by uh, violence in their life. Bill actually still serves as the president of the organization today. With that being said, I just wanted to quickly mention that I am going to be making a donation to the Pettit Family Foundation. Uh, I'm taking the money that I got from every plate and I'm putting that straight into the foundation. So I hope you'll join me in making a donation to the Pettit Family Foundation. Uh, Anything helps can be, you know, a few bucks, but I will have links for that in the description and show notes for you. And shortly after that, Bill actually met Christine Palaf at a fundraising event, and they actually got married in 2012. The next year, on November 28, 2013, they had their one and only son, who they named William Pettit III. In October that same year, Bill became interested in politics, and he considered running for Congress for the Republican Party, but later changed his mind. Instead, he announced a bid for Connecticut's 22nd House District Court in May 2016 and was later elected in 2017. And today, he currently serves as a representative in the Connecticut House of Representatives, and he's been vocal about his disagreements with Connecticut getting rid of the death penalty in 2015. But since the tragic murders of 2007, he's tried his best to rebuild his life. He said in an interview in 2014 that I used to have awful weeks and awful days. Now, most of the time, it's awful minutes and hours. Again, Bill lost his entire family that day. He has since tried to move on the best he can but he'll never forget his wife and two daughters. Jennifer Hawk Pettit was a loving wife and a mother to their children. Haley had the potential and drive to become a doctor just like her father. And Michaela was so young, she was just discovering her love for reading and cooking. And their lives were taken from them far too early. And their extended families in the quiet town of Cheshire, Connecticut will never forget 
the heinous acts that took place on Sorghum Mill Drive. So I'm going to end this episode the proper way by remembering the victims. And I've just got a little bit of a little montage of some different clips of Bill talking about his family. And we're going to leave it there. Thank you guys for joining us for this episode of Lights Out. And we'll see you next time.